Good afternoon, everyone. We're actually going to um, uh, go over several things today uh, and try and whack it all together in our very limited um, and uh, overpacked session, <coughs> and get you as much as you can to um, to practice on and program on and everything like that. So uh, the first bit, I'm actually going to jump away from the shared memory with um, OpenMP area first, so I'll come back to that one. Um, we're loading up some other files. I don't have time to go through these in detail, but let me get started. So, Okay, welcome back. We're continuing. Um, to those people who found the, um, the bugs in the code, thank you, and um, there'll be a slight reward offered, so to speak, uh, a little gift. So anyway, that's uh, the start of where we are. All right, so let me just jump over to another slide. As I said, uh, we're going to be doing this in uh, trying to pack in as much as possible, which you can then read through later. So uh, I'm just going to open up another one where I'm going to talk about some side issues here. <clears throat> These are all important things to do with um, uh, using big machines, and we're going to talk about one of the languages that we do much of the preliminary work in, which is R. Um, so R and Hadoop is one particular area, and um, it's a very useful statistical language. So there's a number of slides here that you can read through uh, in detail later, and these will get you started. So let's go through me as normal. So <clears throat> Why is statistical analysis is important? Um, all these fun things here. So we're looking at the different slides, analysis, etc. type areas. Um, we have um, different graph analysis, PCA, all those sort of things there on the, um, uh, the output. It allows us to visualize data, do data exploration, etc. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat today. Okay, so what has R got to do with big data? Well, number crunching capabilities, statistical analysis, modeling, and it can actually handle very large quantities of data. Uh, I'm slack and behind, and I apologize for that. Uh, we had to um, take some time out because I had to answer queries for the um, uh, top 500 people. Uh, we got selected for review, uh, so uh, one of these fun things, so I had to um, run some tests and everything and send them back to them. So um, um, we'll find out where we are next week on that, but that's all the fun things that keep popping up in, in our lives at the moment to um, add to all this. <coughs> so uh, R basically allows us to do statistical calculations very simply, and there are some great tools to make that into a more um, general run. So if we look at um, uh, some of the things like R to C++, these allow us to take some of the R code and um, uh, actually increase them uh, in efficiency. Now R is an interpreted language and that means we can run lots of large sort of things on the fly, but um, the reality is what we really need is uh, a bit more than that. So what we need is running from a test or one-off or whatever else, we then, then start compiling code and, and running it over many systems quickly. So um, I'm going to send the link to another server that you can SSH into. Um, it's the one with the, um, one or four with a terabyte of RAM for you guys. Uh, that will be open up this afternoon and um, uh, I'll then also load up some uh, using R type areas as well um, and that will get you going. Don't try and use up all one terabyte of RAM. Uh, for If everyone does that then it won't work too well. Um, so there are lots of people using R, large user base, large examples, large package libraries, etc. <coughs> So some of the different areas that are included here include decision trees, heap maps, PCA, self-organizing maps, network analysis, graph analysis, etc. And in fact, there are things such as PSO, uh, particle swarm optimization, Monte Carlo methods, 
and um, even neural networks can be built using R. So if you have a look at the cranrproject.org site, you'll find it's on Windows, Linux, Mac, and many others. So a good good start here, um, R for beginners, and um, some of our slides here will be based on this material. So the normal where we've ripped things off from, <coughs> a quick site and whatever else, and RForge and lots of other things. The book by John MacDonald there is actually very good. I've, I've used that one myself since I did my Masters in Statistics. That was oof, nearly a decade ago now. So very good book. So most R libraries have a user manual. Um, so you have uh, an example there describing how they work, what the calculations are, and um, what we're trying to do is really integrate analysis of data to find information quickly. So uh, just some areas to play with. This file will be loaded up as well as a few how-to uh, libraries. <coughs> you have all the normal arithmetic operators. Uh, being an interpreted language, you can actually run things from the command line or um, scripted or save files, etc. So uh, here we have adding variables, saving those variables, removing, etc. So I'm not going to go into too many details. We don't have enough time in this to actually go through it. I'm I'm going to let you run it yourself. Uh, Q open close bracket is um, uh, for quitting R, so it gets you back to the um, command line. Uh, you can go over history, you can go over the other things, but um, at the end of the day, um, some of the, the things you want to learn are apropos, um, help, etc. Have a bit of a look. Um, have a bit of a play when, when you get the, um, the link later and um, go from there. So some options, um, setting working directory, whether that's Linux or Windows. You'll, you'll see that it's different. In Linux we have um, uh, user crag music um, or the C documents music. Um, not quite sure why I've got music directory linked, but anyway. So data types, array, list factor, matrix, data frame, and time series. And hopefully everyone actually knows the difference between all of those. So, but um, if not, then a bit more reading for you. So as I said, we're going to cycle through this very, very quickly because once again, we have one hour and I'm going to try and cover a few different areas as well as going back to um, OpenMP and explaining that. There, uh, we have factors and matrices. Now, the next part of what I'm going to talk about today has to do with um, matrices. The, um, solving of a, a sparse linear matrix is basically the test for uh, a series of top 500 computers as would be run now. The LINPAC results are done through a, um, well, basically running a distributed uh, matrix solving equation, so linear, linear matrix solving. Okay, so uh, matrix equations are there, how they're added, etc. The operations are all there, so um, data frames, how you create those, what you do with them. I'm not going to go into any details, we're just going to flick through these slides. They're all up there uh, this afternoon, hopefully for you to download and have a bit of a look at. Um, time series, everyone should um, understand that time series are points in time. These are data related to um, events that unfold over time. So this allows you to go back and look at some of the different occurrences that have um, happened and I'm sure everyone has seen these in detail. If you, for instance, go and have a look at a stock ticker or um, look at currency prices or anything like this, they're all time series data. So when we're looking at that, what we effectively have is um, things like frequency, how many things happened at a particular time, uh, what occurred, and from there, this enables us to start, well, analyzing the types of relationships. Sometimes they might be unrelated, and others we can try and find ways of seeing if there's any relation in that. So, <clears throat> handling data with R. So we've got the old Rubik's Cube there. Um, 
Yes, that's the, the link. And accessing values in an object, uh, how we're going to put them in, putting negative numbers in, etc. And um, vectors. So we can create vectors of different elements, random ones or ones where we pull information out of a database. So one of the one of the important things in scripting all of this, of course, is saving your results and saving them to different databases, which we'll get to in a little bit. We can use logical operators, so we can test values, and we can access things in a matrix. So when we're looking at our matrix, we can um, actually look at the, um, the row and column alone, or even work on those. We can solve them that way, etc. So when we're trying to um, uh, grab our data, what we're, we're thinking about in um, uh, large systems is not just what we're, we're applying here. It's very easy to look at a, a matrix of three by three or something like this, but some of these occurrences actually get into the order of thousand by thousand type scenarios or even more. Once every different um, degree of dimensionality increases the complexity, uh, well, it's effectively exponential. It's x squared, x cubed, etc. So when we go from a single vector to a two by two um, type matrix to a, uh, a three dimensional matrix, four dimensional, etc., and things we can't even um, visualize as humans, then it becomes more and more complex. And even simple small matrices can become extremely, incredibly complex once we get into multi-dimensional arrays. So special values, NAND, not a number. Uh, positive infinity, negative infinity, null, null object, and missing values. So uh, we can actually work with all of those. There are different ways of doing it. Some things will compute, some things won't. If we're dividing by zero or nulls, then we have problems and we need to deal with that. Sometimes we need to think about cleaning up or normalizing our data. So um, one of the things you can try on the, the system is logging in and having a look at each of those and um, going from there. So functions for handling data, uh, there's a number there. Table, uh, what we're going to do, randomly choosing numbers, some different samples for you to play with, sort through, order, subsets, uh, creating author tables, joining tables, merging, looking for unique values, looking for duplicated values, um, checking for data in, in sets, etc. So we're going to look next at generating data very quickly. So we've got um, our little quote from Mark Twain and um, here we have Microsoft's uh, now Minecraft program, uh, getting incredibly complex for a very blocky thing, but anyway. And we want to generate some data. So here we're loading um, the values 1 to 10 and we can also do things like calculating values, uh, loading things from databases, etc. We can scan, so we're, we're going to actually load things by scanning, um, generate levels, um, expanding grids, and even random sequences. Sometimes we want to do um, testing of random sequences and um, that sort of thing. So data visualization there, you'll see if you do a quick search on um, data visualization, you'll see there are many forms of data visualization. Nice pretty pictures. Some of the simple ones include plots, box plots, pairs, histograms, or heat maps. And if you load up your data in R, you can do X, Y, plotting, main, X lim, Y lim, etc. That will give you a nice simple plot, which you can uh, see if we go back up. Um, these are far more complex, but this is the start. We can then add colors, start coloring in indices, adding names, and um, all that sort of stuff. So out of the Mandel uh, and Braun book, you see there uh, a particular entry. I recommend if you want to play with R, uh, you can load it up on your own machine. You don't need to necessarily do great big data sets, but if you want to do big data sets, then you need memory. So uh, you can load. So here we have the DAAG data set, uh, which includes the primates. 
So we have the brain sizes of different primates, etc., from rhesus monkey to humans, gorillas, etc. So body mass by the other and seeing how it fits. Iris data, uh, looking at matching uh, different types of flowers. So in these type of things, we have different things like sepal, petal, uh, length, etc. And uh, we're teaching the machine to recognize different types of species. Histogram of islands, size, etc. Uh, what we can see there is, uh, although there are some areas where it doesn't fit, then it's effectively a power series in a way. There's the data for islands, how it comes together in a histogram, etc. We have plots. Here we have a volcano, so we've got a heat map in effect, and we can actually draw um, data over there. So you see the uh, uh, the different topological um, uh, specifications with the um, the differences x and y locations there. The contours are added. And um, that allows us to actually do some very complex analysis. So our heat map here, we can look at um, um, grouping cars, similarity in this case between um, uh, different types of cars and um, then we have uh, sort of tree structures between the relationships that we can analyze and we can group them. So we find that uh, Mercedes 450, uh, SE, SL and SLC are very similar and they're nowhere near a Fenari Dino, for instance. So so there's some ex um, exploratory areas for you to try on there. Now, what you have here is um, a description of how all of these work or what you can pull together, etc. So how to write our functions will be the area you want to play with next and we've got the Lego Meccano type scenario there making some complex thing that does something and what we can do is write either our own programs or functions. Now these are reusable modules. They allow us to carry out complex commands and uh, the great thing is most of the modules that we ever want are out there and we can modify the existing code. Most of the things you find in in um, R blogs and commands and everything like that have already been written. So all we need to do is reapply many of these things to our own data sets. It's not reinventing the wheel and um, contrary to what some people think, you're not stealing by um, going out there to a blog and taking someone else's code to run on your own, especially if you uh, want to do similar types of research, then maybe it's a different area. You apply something else. So that's what we're looking at there. So how to write our functions. Uh, what we have here is uh, creating a function, add two numbers. Uh, then you can run it and get a total. You have to specify arguments. It's very similar to coding in other languages as well. So our, our functions are actually quite simple and have a look through the, um, the reading material and other things. Flow controllers there. We have if, then, um, else type statements, for, while and repeat statements uh, allowing us to flow through. We have looping statements, although some of these work better than others. Uh, if else, so we have um, the normal branching type testing. Uh, if happens one way, go one. Happens another way, we go another, that sort of thing. Um, then we have our results printed at the end. We can do the normal looping. So for whatever to whatever, we print numbers. While loops, and then we have breaks, next, and um, nested loops at the same time. We can also repeat functions. So while a variable um, uh, has not, well, hit a break or something else, we can keep running through it. So at the end of the day, there are lots of things we can try. So writing functions, um, here we have one for pairwise scatter plots. Uh, there are debugging tools as well. Uh, back in the early, early days when I first started using R, which was about a decade ago now, there were no debugging tools originally, which um, actually made life a little bit more difficult. You'd sometimes get results that seemed correct and they'd give you uh, bad warnings. Uh, at the moment, 
uh, I'm having to write some of my own uh, tools in C++ because trying to recreate a new, uh, well, we've got open MPI and um, uh, open MP and whatever else, but um, in trying to integrate some of our systems and get um, CUDA cards talking with Xeon Phi cards, um, having more trouble than I ever suspected, but anyway, that's a different problem. So debugging tools, uh, we're looking at the function to debug, we can turn debugging on and off, etc. So exploratory data analysis, why? Curiosity, we want to see how things work. So some of the initial ways would be things like principal and, uh, component analysis, decision trees, network analysis, or self-organizing maps, SOMs. Now, we give a data matrix with correlated variables, uh, correlated variables, then we can convert that into something we can analyze. That allows us, um, using something like principal component analysis, to just do some initial values and split things up into where it seems that we have the largest variance. So we have here components one, two, three, four, and component one in this instance seems to have the maximal effect. So in this case, we're looking at um, uh, crime results, so murder, assault, urban, uh, what what affects things, how big the urban population is, for, uh, rape, all that sort of stuff. So um, here we have the plot, so uh, rates of murder um, plotted against the population, uh, different cities, etc. And we can then look at the trends. So what happens? Urban population, uh, we've got trending and different types of um, assault. So, other things, visualizing possums, different areas, looking at um, the sizes, etc. So if you have a look at um, the main Donald and Braun book, you see all these and the codes. Decision trees, once again, pedal length, um, this is from our uh, IRIS data set that is actually part of R. Um, and yes, I mentioned a R to C++ uh, converter. Um, I'll send through the links to James and get them to put some of those up there. There are actually some good tools that allow you to um, take your R code and change it back into C++. Um, it's not always optimized though, that, that's something to remember, but um, it can save you a lot of time in getting the initial C code or C++ code and not having to um, uh, start from scratch. So you can worry about optimizing it after you've then uh, created it. So uh, network visualization. People do visualizations on things like Facebook, Twitter, uh, ep epidemic disease spreading, that sort of stuff. Uh, one of the areas I actually uh, do a lot of work on is um, uh, network visualization and analysis of the Bitcoin blockchain, um, block size, transmission speeds, transaction types, etc. Uh, we can look at um, um, cellular networks. Uh, one of the, the guys I have working with me, Ignatius Pang, does a lot of this. Um, the reason I actually poached him in the first place, he, he works part-time for myself and part-time for the University of New South Wales. For me, he does analysis of uh, blockchain uh, interactions. For University of New South Wales, he does uh, disruptive cancer cell stuff. So um, he analyzes protein folding. And uh, there's actually a lot of a lot of similarities between some of these things. So network terminologies, we have a node, node being um, entity in the graph, person in a social network, um, a computer in um, the internet, that sort of thing. And an edge is that line between the two nodes. So that's a relationship between the entities. So Bob and Ellis. So, uh, there's the iGraph library, allows us to do some preliminary graphing. Uh, we have C libraries that we can use with um, uh, both R and Python. These um, enable us to um, go into the R command and create things. Now, we have um, 
uh, example of a toy social network, a, a game-based one there. And um, uh, one of the the first uses of this uh, that I worked with Iggy on was a child grooming investigation uh, for the police. We looked at doing social network analysis, uh, pulling together the different connections between IDs, IP addresses, etc., and um, started mapping the interactions between people talking on social networks. Uh, it's amazing how much information you get, even from things like Facebook or Twitter or whatever else under a, um, uh, what do you call it, a, uh, uh, not a freedom of information, but a, um, a subpoena. Okay, so small example there of a social network. You have um, male and, and, and female, and you can look at the interactions between uh, different parties. Um, and create relationship tables between different ones. So um, there's a how-to for loading the data, so have a bit of a play with that when you get access. Add your nodes, uh, basically follow through. This will be loaded up this afternoon. You can try all this. Um, now, because you won't, you'll only have SSH access, when you're running R, you'll find that um, it doesn't display, of course, you will be saving files if you want them as um, PDFs or images. It will do that, so um, that's something to look out for. Um, you can do dif different colors, visualizations, etc. Um, generally, the way I, I run R myself, uh, apart from when it's local, is to have it save a PDF or an image file. So um, it just saves all those things you're working at. So, you can export your graph, different formats, etc. So other plugins, we have Cytoscape. For those who haven't used it, there's a tutorial, open tutorials, uh, CGL, etc., etc. there for Cytoscape. Um, it allows you to um, visualize very complex networks. Um, one of the examples that we did in the past, this isn't what I'm working on now, uh, have our underage girl Alice our adult male Bob, and we could look at the um, interactions. So, uh, in this case, it was a very simple chat room. Uh, you could change your IP address, and oh, sorry, you change your account, uh, come in from a different IP address, etc. Uh, but there were some other areas that we were looking at. Uh, we looked at mapping IP addresses, visualizing nodes, uh, what people were saying, a relationship between these. Um, and that allowed us to start looking at um, uh, particular associations between groups of addresses. And um, uh, we started with a particular group of um, 25, 86 people and started filtering the network to only those who were possibly uh, interacting. Um, can run SSHX in an X11 session, um, possibly. I don't generally uh, run uh, remote hex that way, and um, might be a bit difficult hopping from machine to machine. But hmm, see how you go. Um, might be a bit slow too. Not sure. Multiple people are trying to access um, X11 over a shared internet link. Yeah. Don't know, haven't actually tried it that way. Okay, so uh, finding edges are important. So uh, the more accurate we can get that, the better. And um, over time, we can start looking at the relationships and find, in this case, we actually um, um, enabled the police to have a few suspects, a particular one that had been talking and trying to hide their identity. So self-organizing maps, SOMs, and supervised methods uh, are available. These allow you to have data that um, uh, doesn't need a training set. Uh, examples there are the iris data set and the wine flavor data set that you can actually load up and try. Um, flowers of similar, similar, similar attributes are uh, uh, put together. So looking at yellow versus cyan versus magenta or whatever else coloring. Uh, for um, different types of similar irises in this case. 
And um, one thing to note is you do find outliers in any of these things. So um, outliers are important. Uh, and from from this isolated and the self-organizing map, uh, you can see that the Versicolor uh, uh, Virginius here and the Setosa type irises each form differences in how they um, uh, are grouped. The things like color, sepal length, petal length, petal width, etc., allow you to map how that actually comes about. So wine flavor, um, there's a data set wines that you can have a look at, uh, alcohol, malic acid, ash, whatever else that people actually rate wine on can be used to um, tell the difference, is allow a computer to start analyzing wine. So we can look at the same data set in two different ways. We've got uh, two different types of visualization next to each other. And um, some of the uses that this could actually go towards would be things like personalized medicine. It allows you to help with classification, etc. cetera. Uh, Iggy's work, he does a lot with um, um, things like um, cancers and genomes and all that and um, does that sort of analysis. So these things enable us to get an image that will help us humans determine what we should be looking for. We are very good at analyzing graphical results. So things to think about, we should not look at um, um, biases that aren't there. So um, in the case of things like Twitter or Facebook or particularly some of the newer things like um, Instagram or uh, Snapchat, the majority of users are going to be younger and tech savvy. So you're going to underrepresent uh, people who are in their 50s and 60s and, and you're not going to necessarily be able to get good data results from that. You need to be, uh, be cognizant of the amount of detail you have, the different types of groups and whatever else, whether they're going to be there. and um, Sometimes if you have too many data points, you can actually overpower your results and um, it doesn't mean anything anyway. One of the big problems that Google have been showing recently is in neural networks, you can actually overtrain. And after a time, you can start turning anything into anything. It uh, overdoes the results and um, um, you teach something to be what it's not. So unsupervised versus supervised learning. Uh, with um, supervised learning, you uh, basically interact. Uh, unsupervised learning is, um, uh, well, hope for the best. So with uh, unsupervised learning, you don't really know what's going to happen, but um, uh, you've got to remember with supervised learning, you are interacting and trying to lead the data a certain way, which means fine-grained analysis in unsupervised learning, uh, you don't always know where you're going to um, end up and reliability can be an issue. So some references there, uh, John Main Donald and Emmanuel Paradis are for beginners. I recommend both of those to start. Now before I go back to the Open MP, I'm going to just jump over to a slide uh, just to explain some of the bits of how things work from HP. Um, this is just a little bit from the HP guys. Um, I do still use some of their systems, but not so many today. These are actually um, old. The um, tuning Linpack uh, hasn't changed. Uh, there are a number of people who think that Linpack should be updated because it doesn't reflect the uses of a modern computer, and in many ways it doesn't. Um, there are things like the Graph 500 that um, are probably more accurate for some uses today, um, but Top 500 is still the, the main one that people recognize, even if um, Linpack N by N type solutions aren't always the one that are the most common. So I'm just picking on this because it, it's um, not actually mine, but it's from the um, technical system at HP and it just gives a good overview of what Linpack actually is. So top 500 list is um, used by vendors as a criteria for purchase, what you can get, how power efficient, how everything else. 
Um, and that's the top 500 list there. What is LINPAC? LINPAC is a uh, N by N matrix linear uh, solution, uh, not using some of the faster things like the Strassen method. Uh, strangely enough, um, one of my old company names before we called it COIN was Strassen, uh, but that's a different thing. We won't worry about that at the moment, but Strassen method is a, a, a faster way of solving uh, linear matrices that has uh, come up, um, but it's not one you can use for um, the top 500. To standardize, they don't allow you to um, change the algorithms. Uh, if you do, then you get knocked off. So LIMPAC N by N report gives you N max. So this is the size of the problem run on the machine. R max, the performance in gigaflops uh, for the problem run on the machine. It's still standardized in gigaflops. Uh, back in the day uh, when teraflops were uh, considered use, uh, huge, then this mattered, but now we're running to where individual machines can be in um, tens or more teraflops sometime for high-end workstations anyway. Um, and half is where 50% uh, of the RMAX execution rate is achieved, and R peak is the theoretical performance in an idealized world where everything is perfect and there's no latency and no whatever else. So, old systems um, used to be 43 point whatever gigaflops would get you into having a top 500 computer 15 years ago. A little bit different now. So these are the old ones. Have a look at the top 500 now. This is this is ancient, of course, uh, 15 years ago. And um, the Netlib org benchmark HPL allows you, if you run it over everything, to um, uh, go over and see how fast machines run. There's actually LINPAC even now for phones. I have a LINPAC uh, app for my, my Android phone, interestingly enough. Um, just strange things you do. It allows me to um, uh, just compare the, the speed of my, my phone in, in solving problems. Not that that necessarily matters much to most people, but um, just one of these things you can do. And my Samsung, um, I've now got a uh, an S6. It rates at um, uh, enough that 30 of them would have once, uh, 30 of them paralleled, coded, and I don't know how I'd connect up the phones. Uh, together to make a cluster, but if I could connect 30 of them, I would have once got into the top 500. Um, so a few years from now, I'll have a single phone that could have once been a top 500 computer. So caveats, um, just a little bit about how the uh, the matrices are generally factored, etc. Um, eight panels, processes, what goes through, how it calculates. There are some good um, papers on this if people are interested as well. Um, it's not really relevant much to what we're doing. Um, the oops function there is uh, really all about tuning, etc. Um, characteristics of HPL. Uh, let me grab something else. And. Um, goes into how it's calculated, etc. cetera. Um, tuning, the tuning is the most difficult part. Uh, actually getting it right takes a lot of time. Um, you end up running a lot of tests just to um, try and get a result that, well, is optimal. So let me jump now across to a book I want, oops, I want to demonstrate. Now, let me go back to the beginning of this book. Oops. I'll do the easy way. There we go. So, this is one I recommend as well, optimizing HPC applications with Intel cluster tools. Um, it's actually free uh, out there in the world. I will 
uh, I'll get Ray to uh, grab the, the link from me and you can load it into your Google Play account uh, without having to pay any money at all. So it, it's quite good. It uh, uh, goes into uh, the differences in, in coding for MPI, etc. Uh, goes into the different libraries, uh, 300 pages of reading and uh, all about memory parallelization and all those other fun and funky things. So let me now jump back to our slides. So shared memory programming. Okay, so let's go into uh, some of the bits and pieces here. Um, OpenMP has been around for some time. Uh, now, differences of Fortran versus the other. Now, this covers off some of the areas we, you know, that we did the other week, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. But what we're trying to ensure is that our code runs correctly. Now, let me just jump through where I should be. So, uh, and that takes us to distributed memory programming, MPI. Now, OpenMPI is one of the uh, free versions of uh, the memory programming interfaces and um, uh, message passing interface, should say, uh, that we get. And there's an Intel MPI as well. So, this allows us to um, uh, talk between different machines, for instance. So MPI is a standard. It's been around for 20 years now. So um, cooperating sequential processes then have a mechanism for exchange. What is MPI? It's a way of developing parallel programs with messages. Communication models uh, based on distributed memory or distributed systems. So this is really what most of a top 500 supercomputer is about. It's about allowing us to not only distribute CPU but memory. So when we're loading systems up, we want to be able to load them across uh, multiple memory nodes, etc., and run things well that we wouldn't normally run. So if we think about, for instance, what we could possibly run, then just think how large data sets can be. If you start thinking about the size of a data set where you have um, 10 different frames that you're investigating, so 10 dimensions, and you maybe have 10,000 uh, data points only per frame, then very quickly you get into extremely large data sets. So you start thinking, what if I had something um, like a network map between interacting people on Facebook? And you want to start doing some real analysis of that data. And very quickly you, you see that the amount of memory needed for any uh, reasonable analysis becomes hugely large. So explicit communication, uh, we're looking at um, uh, calls into the program explicitly, uh, point to point, uh, workstation, workstation, etc. What is a message? Message is data to be passed uh, and um, some user-based integer or tag. It's a way of communicating between the machines effectively. We need to tell what data is there, uh, how much data, and um, how many times we're going to do it. So MPI terms, non-blocking. Function may return before the operation competes, uh, completes. Uh, blocking. Return from the function indicates the user is allowed to reuse resources specified in the call. Local completion of the function depends on the local executing process and non-local completion of the operation may require execution of some MPI function on another process. So we have all of those things to consider. And um, overall, we need to make sure that uh, we have this run the most effectively uh, based on returning everything to our hardware and not locking systems up. Remember, the cost of equipment, power, and all the rest is actually quite expensive. Um, now, the space to complete lab two or three on the new node or previous ones we have access to. 
I'm guessing lab four will be on the new node. Yes, R will be on the new node. Uh, so that you've got more memory to play with. Now, what you, uh, where for lab two and three, you can do those on the other nodes. Um, and what we're going to do next week is we're going to um, do a, a run through of the different labs, um, all the questions and everything like that. It hasn't quite followed the original plans or anything like that that we uh, we set, unfortunately, um, uh, between end of tax year, uh, raising uh, capital, all that sort of fun stuff uh, has uh, crimped how things have occurred. Um, the new machine will have R that you'll be logging onto this afternoon. Uh, it's also got, um, uh, they've got multiple terabytes worth of RAM between them, um, so that should keep you from causing too many problems. So you'll get that uh, loaded up. I'll be sending it off to James today. They're all set up with your username and password, the same one as uh, what you were issued the first time, so hopefully that will all work. Okay, MPI, communicator and rank. Um, basically, um, uh, how we process, etc. Uh, MPI file functions, uh, initialization, won't go into the details. Um, there are, I guess the best way to to get into this is to read the uh, attached instruction sheets and just try some of the um, uh, the code and headers. Uh, much better than listening to me trying to explain how to do it rather than uh, actually getting dirty in the code and, and trying it. Um, MPI shutdown, uh, cleaning up state, etc. Uh, startup, Fortran example, MPI, MPI data, send and receive, etc. So a little bit of reading there. Um, you can cut and paste and try some of this um, afterwards. Some of the examples, uh, MPI header file before, um, our different send and receive modes, whether we're in blocking or non-blocking, um, both Fortran and C examples here, of course. So collective communication, what we're looking at here is any communication between the systems uh, involving some group of processes. So uh, broadcasts, scans, reduction and scatter mode, etc. Barrier synchronization, uh, we want all uh, different processes to um, have the same barrier called. Um, we can synchronize messages that way. Uh, we can broadcast a message so we can get it to everyone, uh, reduce operations, and um, what we want to make sure is we have things that interoperate. Now, one of the problems I'm still trying to get is interoperation between different types of vendors. Um, so far, failing miserably, but um, it doesn't mean I'll give up. We're trying, uh, trying to effectively have more than just open MPI libraries. What I'd, personally, what I'd actually like to be able to do is have the cores between um, um, NVIDIA and Intel talking correctly. The problem uh, we're finding is the NVIDIA cards with the, in the CUDA type model, you have lots and lots of little tiny cores with very small amounts of memory. Uh, at the same time, when you have an Intel Phi card, you have um, larger amounts of memory but smaller numbers of cores. So it becomes actually quite difficult to get the damn things talking in the same way without wasting a lot of processing power, but anyway, things to do. Uh, okay, um, all right, I'll make sure that the um, IC Lab OpenMP tutorial is loaded tonight. Um, I didn't realize that wasn't linked there, um, sorry about that. Um, I'll get um, Ray to put down a note so that you'll have it first thing in the morning at the latest. Um, 
I probably left it under root or something silly. Um, I apologise for that. We haven't had a, um, a run through on this course. We just uh, it's been um, hectic to say the least. So um, uh, you're the trial uh, trial version of all of this. Okay, Intel MPI has a thread safe version. Um, other things we can do. We have uh, funneling multi-threaded but only the main thread will make MPE calls, uh, serialized or multiples. So a little bit of code and how to once again. Uh, performance optimization, once again we want to try and make this as quick and effective as possible. Uh, no wasting. We want to be able to compile and run things effectively without errors. Yep, if um, you haven't got that there, it, I'm, I'm pretty sure it would be in the, um, uh, the zip file, but um, I should have actually loaded it. And um, I apologize for not putting it in the correct directory, but I will make sure that that does go there. Um, knowing me, I probably put it underneath root once again and not linked it. So anyway, we'll fix that up. Okay, compiling and running, um, Intel MPI, you've got the different applications, MPI, ICC, etc, etc, etc. MPI run allows us to run across different um, uh, CPUs, etc. So when we're running these things, uh, we can run it over multiple uh, CPUs, multiple cards, multiple whatever else. So a little bit on the code to read. Uh, documentation, so we have MPI run uh, that you'll be going through and um, and playing with. Now, just to try and find where my other slide is again. Just jump back to this one. Okay, so when you're looking at um, uh, things like R, whoops, I'll go right back to the beginning. It doesn't seem to want to go back to the beginning for me. Hmm. Ah, silly thing. Hmm. Kill that. Start again. There we go. <laughs> Silly thing. Anyway, um, what we're trying to do is analyze our data in such a way that we get a result that um, simplifies what might be out there, what we have received, but not overly simplifies it beyond having something of use. So we're trying to crunch a lot of data and as we get more and more systems, we will get more and more data. Now, big data is becoming more and more critical because we're getting more of it. So um, Hadoop, Mongo, all these things are getting bigger data sets for us as uh, more people connect to the web. We have uh, billions of IP addresses being used right at the moment, billions of nodes being connected, and in the next decade we probably expect to have um, uh, upward of 80 to 100 billion devices connected to the internet at any time. Now they're not going to be people of course, they're going to be machines and things that we have with us and all types of things. And I know we like to to think about uh, that's a large number. I actually think it's on the low side. Right at the moment, um, just for myself, I have in this office here uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, around fifteen different devices all connected to the internet simultaneously and that's for one of me. If we have even a fraction of the world's population, um, not just where they are, but home and all the rest with uh, IP address machines on IPv6 networks, etc., then we're going to quickly find that 
80 billion isn't a lot. So that would be maybe 40 devices, IP addresses per highly connected person. And I'd say there'd probably be about 2 billion highly connected people in um, that sort of time frame. If you start thinking about that, those numbers become large very quickly. And we start thinking, how would we do that? But in my office here, not only have I got several computers, I've got a laptop and a smaller laptop and a, a works, desktop works, workstation. But um, the monitor I'm, I'm looking at right now and the monitor on my side um, each have 486 chips. They're uh, 4G and they have um, um, an internet connection, an IP address. The desk phone I have is a VoIP phone. So it has an IP address. The camera I have in front of me is connected. The watch, uh, smart watch I have there is connected. The tablet, the small reading tablet, the phone, uh, they're all connected. We start thinking about everything that we're going to have in the future and um, there we go. So. Um, ARF Windows is quite cool. Yes, I actually love R. It's a great program. Uh, if you haven't played with it, I recommend it. It's it's very simple and easy to learn very quickly, and um, it handles uh, quite large memory sets very well. It's not always the fastest, but that's where um, I will right after this get uh, point you to some R to C++ converters. And if you need to run data again and again, not just use it as a model or a toy, uh, then you can actually convert it into something that runs far quicker. You can optimize R, but um, that's something that, well, takes time and practice. Okay, so we're coming to the um, end of things uh, again. We're not not finished quite yet. Next week we're going to go over um, the labs and uh, all that sort of stuff um, and I'll also will get you sort of what you need to do by the weekend to try and win yourself a FI card other than finding bugs in my, um, my documents or flaws in the code um, and thank you for that. Then um, we will uh, effectively um, have you submit and try and win uh, based on all of that. So next week is our final, but we're not going to really cover anything more. Uh, we're going to be here, of course, and we're going to let you play. Um, I'm sending through the SSH details um, right after this and the R to C++ details right after this. Um, and there's some more reading up there for you to do and um, we go from there. So uh, the big thing with R is it really slows down if you run out of memory. So tuning it so that you don't run out of memory becomes one of the skills that you want to do. The other way of doing that is throw lots of memory at it, in which case it runs fast even when it's not optimized. But then there's a fee and a cost because Memory is not cheap. It's actually very, very expensive. If anyone's seen some of the um, newer chips, the 64 gig uh, DDR3 uh, type um, chips that have come out, they're horrendously expensive to tell you the truth. So anyway, um, I will end at this point and uh, hand everyone back to um, James and, and Ray and things like that and I'll chase up the little bits and pieces that um, I need to get to you today and um, we'll go from there and catch you again next week. Thank you.